Canada, second largest country in the world, and possibly the smuggest. People around the globe universally admire Canadians, and Canadians universally hate Torontonians. Canada, stretching from sea to shining me. I'm Rick Green, and I'm as Canadian as a hockey puck, and far smarter. I was born here, my father was born here, and my grandfather was born over there, in England. Sort of like Canada was. It has taken almost two centuries to break our ties with Mother Britain and become an independent nation, one with its own identity, no longer dependent on Britain, but rather... <laughs> Canadian independence has been two prime ministers forward, one prime minister back. So, let's meet the PM team. Number one, Johnny Chuggerlug McDonald. Number two, sober Alexander McKenzie. Three, John the Temp Abbott. Four, hotshot John Thompson. Crackpot Mackenzie Bowell, Chunky Charles Tupper, Lucky Seven Wilfred the Tongue Laurier, Rowdy Robert Borden, Arthur the Meanie Mean, Mackenzie the Terminator King, Richard Dick to You Bennett, Uncle Louis Laurent, Unlucky Thirteen John Crazy Legs Diefenbaker, Lester Peacemaker Pearson, Pierre Hot to Trot Trudeau. Bumbling Joe Clark, Bumbling John Turner, Brian, Mr. Humility Mulrooney, Kim, the official sacrificial Campbell, 20, tough guy Jacques Crutchet, and 21, Paul, Mr. Minority Martin. All right, liberals on the left, Tories on the right, every other party in the middle. Talk about two solitudes. Married men on the left, bachelors and bachelorettes on the right, got married while in office in the middle. Ah, Mr. Trudeau. And got divorced while in office? Ah, Mr. Trudeau. All the Johns on the left, everyone else on the right. Um, Mr. King? Not that kind of John. Those who were in office more than eight years on the left, two years or less on the right, everyone else in the middle. Apparently, we either love them or hate them. French Canadians on the left, English Canadians on the right, everyone else in the middle. Those who won no elections on the left, those who won just one election in the middle, those who won two or more on the right. Boy, who needs elections? Whites on the left, all other races, creeds, and colors on the right. Catholics on the left, Protestants on the right, Jews, Muslims, Hindus, and Buddhists in the middle. Women on the left, men on the right. And finally, British heritage on the left, French heritage on the right, everyone else in the middle. Ah, uh, Diefenbaker. All right, hit the shower. So clearly our British roots run very deep and right to the top. This is the story of Canadian independence from Britain. This is the story of our prime ministers, their hard work, their bumbling buffoonery, and their sophisticated chicanery, all paid for by your tax dollars. Yes, history bites Mother Britain. First, be warned. Everything you know about Canada is probably wrong because even the historians can't agree on anything. Canada didn't gain independence through war like America or civil disobedience like India or mob violence like the French Revolution. No, no. We had all three in sensible Canadian doses. And everyone knows this nation was founded without violence. Hooey! We did a lot of things that moved us away from Britain but we often gain more independence by things we didn't do. Simple example. Crisis in the British Empire. As Greece and Turkey take up arms over disputed territory, Britain beseeches her loyal dominions to send troops if war should erupt, and Canada stands ready. After losing 50,000 Canadians in the Great War, we are delighted to be asked to send more boys to die in some distant land. I will have to check with Parliament yeah, uh, government is on summer vacation 
You know, uh, they're all up at the cottage. You know. Before her loyal subjects can be summoned from the cottage, the British government is defeated, and the new prime minister rescinds the call for troops. Sorry about that. Now you know Canada has a long and proud history of peacekeeping and other UN missions, but as I warned you off the top, what you know may not be the whole story. Time and again, we also sent troops to defend the British Empire until a couple of world wars took the fun out of the fighting. Wow. Here's another fact everyone knows about Canada, whose passionate support was the key to Confederation. Was it Sir John A. Macdonald? Was it Charles Tupper? Was it Alexander Mackenzie? The correct answer is Edward Cardwell, Britain's colonial secretary. That's right. As we'll see, by 1860, a major force pushing for Canada to become independent from Britain was Britain. Her Majesty's government eagerly and anxiously looks forward to the Canadian colonies becoming more independent, <clears throat> especially financially. You see, the colonies are very young, like a teenager. And like every teenager, Canada is becoming a very expensive pain. We believe it's time for Canada to move out on her own. We'll even help her pack her stuff and uh, find her someplace nice to set up a capital city. <clears throat> the story of Canada becoming independent from Britain could well have been the story of Canada becoming independent from France, but it wasn't. Why? Canada, today a bustling nation. Long ago, nothing but natural resources waiting to be turned into cars, TV sets, and atomic bombs. The naive natives have no idea how valuable the land is. They simply live on it. But Europeans change that. The Vikings set up camp, but soon leave at the request of the Beothuk people. It's a last request. Then comes Giovanni Cabotto, known as John Cabot because it's easier to pronounce. Cabot claims Canada for England and reports there are inexhaustible amounts of cod. Modern technology proves him wrong. Jacques Cartier then claims Canada for France. He persuades natives to return with him to be exposed to European ideas and diseases. Then comes Henry Hudson. He claims Canada for England again. Trying to reach the Orient, Hudson goes north and west, south, west, northwest, until his crew's had enough. Others follow. Samuel de Champlain believes that the route to China is up the St. Lawrence River. He rapidly learns otherwise. British and French ships continue probing for a route around Canada until someone discovers that the little beaver makes a great hat. Many great hats. Canada's no longer an obstacle, it's something to fight over. The long war for control of Canada comes down to one battle, the Plains of Abraham. The French control the fur trade in southern Canada and the British want it. So 9,000 British troops land on the south shore and lay siege to Quebec City on the north shore. British General Wolfe begins bombarding French General Montcalm and his troops. Jake. What do you mean wrong era? This is the wrong planet. Look, the script was very specific about what kind of military... Fine. So, British General Wolfe bombards the French zombie lizards and all of his attacks fail. Months pass, his men lose heart. Finally, one night, the British uh, robot warriors sneak across the river and scale the cliffs. Surprised, the zombie lizards leave the safety of the Citadel of Quebec to battle on the Plains of Abraham. It's a crucial blunder. In the ensuing 15-minute melee, the robotic General Wolf and the other robot, General Montcalm, are both killed. And Canada falls under the control of the British robot warrior guys. For the next hundred years or so, the British run a growing collection of Canadian colonies. And they do it with something called the Family Compact. First, I am delighted to be the new Governor of Canada. I have been appointed by the Foreign Office in London, who report to the Parliament in London, report to the Queen in London. Or is it King? No, oh, wait, wait, wait. Oh no, it's a, it's a Queen this year. Handsome woman. <laughs> now, Every colony will be run by a lieutenant governor who, who reports uh, to me. Uh, there is an elected legislator which reports to them, and of course, the voters uh, have no say so, unless I say so. <laughs> it's actually all a lot of input from my rich and, and powerful friends. You see, power flows down and, well, and up a bit. And it's 
going around. Uh, uh, really, it's all run by the by the family compact. It's a, it's a who's who who decides what's what. Any questions? Well done, Dad. Good show, brother. I like it, Uncle. By 1776, the Americans have had enough of British rule and begin fighting for independence. Washington crosses the Delaware, Paul Revere rides, and 13 years later, the 13 colonies are a new nation. But in Canada, the sentiments are somewhat softer. The British are coming! The British are coming! Quasi-democracy with quasi-dictatorship made for a queasy compromise. After seeing Americans revolt over taxation without representation, Canadian colonists became increasingly vocal and increasingly loud until they were heard across the colonies in Upper and Lower Canada. You have no idea what's what here in Upper Canada. We are the true voice of Lower Canada. They may be listening to what the weak the folk is saying to them. Is and our council of lies will be and moved at high and mighty bloody Newsom's damn the contract uh, no, to pay him. No, 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 monsieur, you are wrong, oh, you are wrong. Oh, shut your cake hole, you bloody crackpot. You don't know what you're talking we about. We hate the anglais. We have drawn up a list of resolutions. It's undemocratic. We, we want, want a say in our future, future with real power and an elected, elected assembly. Go! Mon Dieu! Back! We're agreed, laddie. William Lyon Mackenzie. Oh, je m'appelle Jean Papineau. Put her there, je m'appelle. The Upper Canada Rebellion began right here near the intersection of Young and Eglinton, back when Toronto was called York, over a hundred and something years ago, in 1837. That's when this man, actor Wayne Robson. William Lyon Mackenzie. Yeah, a rabble-rousing newspaper man addressed a tavern full of drunk of Angry farmers. Oh. We've had it with a family compact. They smashed my printing presses, but they can't silence our voices. He's with me. Great, right, all right, come on. <laughs> Rebellion. This is going to be so. <laughs> British troops march north to meet the rebels near what is now Maple Leaf Gardens. <laughs> oh, Mackenzie's rebels square off against <gasps> Queen Victoria's regulars. Queen Victoria's regulars. Well, Doc. Uh oh, uh -oh they've right seen now. us. We couldn't get permission to use real guns. He shoots, he runs. Ah, the British are coming. A few the people British were killed, and Mackenzie King ran north and then west and then south all the way to America. Lower down the river in Lower Canada, Joseph Papineau inflamed fellow French Canadians with talk of rights, power, respect. Papineau talked the talk, but he didn't walk the walk. He ran the ran all the way to the American border before the first shots were even fired. But unlike the Upper Canada Rebellion, which fizzled out in a day, the Lower Canada Rebellion fizzled out after three or four days. Still, it was not in vain. Well, not exactly. Hi, I'm Rick Green, the creator of History Bites. Thanks for watching. Make sure you share and like and definitely subscribe to History Bites.